Uh, <clears throat> okay, this will be recorded on film and it will uh, not embrace the audience, so, but if any of you don't like the notion of it being on film, uh, you're quite welcome to leave. <laughs> you may find other reasons to leave as the thing progresses. Uh, well, Norman LeBrock, obviously he was uh, famous or notorious uh, for one thing, he was uh, Jersey's only communist politician. And in fact, when he was in uh, politics, there was only one other communist, and there, as I understand it, there's only been one other communist representative in the UK, a Scottish MP. So there were only two, Norman being uh, one of them. Norman was born in 1922, it's the 100th uh, year. He died in 1996 when he was aged 74. Uh, he won a scholarship to Victoria College. Uh, he left there at about the age of 17. Uh, his most uh, notable, other than his political conversion, which I'll come to, but his most notable uh, move there was he would not take part in the college cadet force because of his views on presumably war and pacifism. Um, and that basically is it, except for one unfortunate and major and traumatic incident in his life. At the age of about 11, going on 12, he woke up in the morning and all his family were dead. Uh, his two siblings and his mother and father. And uh, <clears throat> what had transpired had happened, this was in 1934, they had uh, slept on the same floor and one of the parents, it was never known who, one of the parents had turned the gas on and split the, um, the pipe. So the gas seeped out and uh, they all died, the two siblings. Norman was sleeping on a top floor and survived and he was the first obviously to confront the situation. Uh, and you'll hear him talk about it when we uh, <clears throat> get on a bit of tape. Well, not in great detail, he's never talked about it uh, in any detail uh, <clears throat> for maybe obvious reasons. So let's see if we can get the tape moving. This is the introduction, and here are his own words. Now, by the um, whoops, I'm going to need a bit of. Uh, Thank you. 
reference to Marxist ideology, but I must say it was a very um, teenage uh, and rather confused, I, I freely admit, with hindsight uh, point of view at that time. Uh, I'll tell you how mixed up and confused it was because uh, I was also a member of the Methodist Church. And in fact, during 1941, I became a lay preacher for some time uh, in the local Methodist Church. About the same time, and I'm very bad about specific dates, but uh, sometime in 1941, I met a chap called Leslie Hewlin. Uh, Les was uh, to play quite a big part in uh, my life, and in fact, many people's lives during the occupation over here. Les, as a young man in the tail end of the 20s or possibly the very early 1930s, as a apprentice plumber at that time, he uh, served in the time of Tom McCain's in uh, uh, New Street, Les had emigrated to Australia, where he joined the Australian Communist Party and in fact worked for them as a full-time organiser at one time. In, uh, I'm not sure about when, but probably about 1938, or beginning of 39, Les Hewlin informed the idea of coming to uh, fight in the international brigades in Spain. But at that time, nobody was recruiting in Australia for the international brigades, and he had to uh, collect enough money to pay his passage to Europe, which he did. He landed uh, somewhere in Italy from Australia, at almost exactly the same time as uh, uh, government forces in Spain collapsed and the international brigades were disbanded. And Therese's great adventure didn't happen. He then came back to his native island to collect enough money together uh, to get back to Australia. Um, he was caught here by the occupation and in fact uh, uh, worked over here right through the, uh, uh, the occupation and finally got himself enough money to get married and get back to Australia, I think about 1937, 1948. He's still alive with words, I still correspond. Thank you, ladies. Oh. Okay. You may have gathered certain things there, um, how he moved into communism. He maintains, that was by the way an address to the Channel Island Occupation Society, he maintains that it was the Spanish Civil War that was the major influence. And it was this guy, Les Hewlin, and we've got a photograph of him. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got a photograph of the early JDM with Les Hewlin uh, second in on the uh, photo, which we can move around. He did go back, as uh, Norman said, to Australia. But they kept in touch till the end of uh, his life. <clears throat> the other thing was his uh, little dalliance with Methodism, which uh, you sometimes get those two things going together, two sets of beliefs, <laughs> believe it or not, even though obviously communism is a godless uh, ideology, obviously, but occasionally uh, the two do come together. But it was the battle against fascism, Spain, and to an extent Germany. Uh, the strange thing is, like Russia, of course, Jersey was not an industrial society. Norman did write a little book, which I'll send around, where he talks of all the industrial disputes and the growth of trade unions and so forth. But obviously Jersey wasn't an ideal uh, fertile ground for the formation of communism. The Jersey Communist Party was founded in 1939. It was obviously a small group of people and remained a small group of people. During the war, and that's what Norman was talking about in that talk, uh, he associated with three people, Hewlin, who couldn't get back to Australia, Stella Perkins, who some of you will know as running the bookshop on uh, St. James Street for the JDM, and then Norman himself. And, and their main activities were aid to prisoners, which he, he flew quite close to the wind. Uh, distribution of the printed word, distribution of leaflets and so forth and so on. Again, highly dangerous stuff. And at the end of the war, 
an attempt to foment uh, rebellion amongst German soldiers. And they found a chap called Mulbiak, I think was his name. And he, uh, he gave them an entree into the, uh, the German forces. He was very uh, anti-Hitler. And again, fairly dangerous stuff. And the other thing, which I'll uh, come back to, he got involved obviously with Russian uh, and Eastern prisoners. And one of the most uh, famous he got involved with was this guy, Bill who was looked after by Louisa Gould, some of you will remember. Mm -hmm. But put that in your mind, because we are going to revisit uh, that story. And as a result of all this, uh, it was Norman, I think, who founded the Westmount Commemoration, which of course we just uh, experienced. <clears throat> he was also involved in a wartime discussion group, where there was a group of people, there was one in England, as you may recall, but there was one here, they were trying to work out what direction the island should take after the war. And Bob Rousseau was a member, although Bob makes it clear in his most recent book that uh, he obviously wasn't on uh, Norman's political <laughs> wavelength, although maybe he could have been, but he wasn't. And the Jersey Democratic movement, which has had a long history, um, uh, a lot of... Uh, Bifurcations, as they say, splits and re-splits and reunifications. Uh, it was formed in the war in about 1943. And of course it only officially disbanded quite recently, as you probably know. Although I suppose the reformed Jersey would see themselves as the uh, heirs apparent. Politics was very lively after the war. There were mass meetings at West Park, which Norman uh, often addressed. There used to be five according to the JEP, who were his nemesis, by the way. There were five to eight hundred people in attendance at these meetings, and uh, there was always an inevitable conclusion. There used to be a shouting match. Uh, who's going to pay for it? was the standard call out of the audience. And then another wag would say, Moscow. And, uh, and then the whole meeting would uh, collapse into chaos, and there were about two police officers present, and Jer Norman and his tight little group would then run to the police station uh, to get away from uh, the overexcited mob. That place, I mean, it was fairly live politics. This was in the lead-in to the 1945 election, when they had high hopes, rather as in England, where the socialists obviously were to uh, be very successful in the election. They had high hopes of uh, winning. And uh, their manifesto uh, will not uh, strike you as terribly radical. There should be adequate compensation for states' members. There should be a modern, equitable divorce law. There should be an augmented all-island police force. Remember, this is when the honorees could only allow the states' police to operate by permission within their parish. So it was all very uh, localised. There should be compulsory health insurance. There should be free education to 16 a maximum working week, a minimum wage, etc. But they were accused by the JEP of having behaved with utter dishonour during the war. <clears throat> and uh, there was a never-ending conflict, and there's no doubt this stayed with Norman and the Communist Party for years, this conflict and, and the feelings that had been aroused by the run-in with the JEP. The JEP essentially called them treacherous, they said they had given the Germans documents towards the end of the war, which um, should never have been released to the Germans. And uh, that put the JDM on the back foot for quite a long time, this, this uh, ongoing conflict. And uh, it led to some very, very, uh, <clears throat> very uh, strong editorials from the uh, JEP. Uh, the JDM, their view was that the JPP, this was the advent of two political parties, the Jersey Progressive Party, with names like Rumford, Krzyzewski, Le Marcon, names that were to resonate in the succeeding years. The Jersey Progressive Party, who formed partly to deal with the perceived threat of the JDM. And the Jersey Progressive Party, uh, they essentially uh, operated in the urban areas and they left the rural areas to look after themselves because they assumed that there would be a JPP-type victory in the uh, rural areas. 
But nevertheless, there were two major parties fighting that election. And uh, <clears throat> the JPP was described by the JDM, recognize these so-called progressives for what they are, political stooges for our present states. New masks hiding a face of reaction. They are sponsoring a new party led by friends, relatives and associates of the present state's members. Uh, nothing <laughs> nothing <laughs> changes. Um, but any, the end result was the JDM were well and truly trounced at the election. They only got one member in, a guy called uh, Stephen Venables. He became a deputy in town. And the rest went to the JPP. But on the vote itself, they did reasonably well. They, did, they got about, even in the rural areas, I think they got about 26% of the votes. And um, in the town area, they got about 42% of the votes, the JDM. So they did quite well on, on a vote total basis but certainly not in terms of uh, members. And the JPP was to assume power, and uh, it, it could be argued that basically it's them and their heirs who've remained in power ever since. You know, they're the people. So they've always been on the back foot as a minority, basically. Okay. So Norman, meanwhile, was running for most elections. He ran for six elections, um, before he was elected in 1966. And even then, there were two big breaks in his period of office until about 1987, where he lost the election. And there was one infamous case, and it's mentioned in Reg Jones' memoirs, where Reg was basically wheeled out deliberately to oppose Norman LeBrock uh, in one of the town areas, I think number two, and, he, uh, and Reg won it. He won that election. Um, but he makes it quite clear what he was told uh, about the nature of the election. So there was this incredible fear. You've got to remember at this time the Cold War was well and truly underway. And uh, that, the fear that people felt about communism and so forth had quite clearly uh, percolated down. <clears throat> they uh, renewed their manifesto in 1961, the... Uh, JDM, and I'll give you a couple of quotes because they do resonate. On the question of housing, they have no policy, the JPP, except to bemoan the lack of sites and the high cost of building. On the traffic problem, they have no solution save traffic bollards and no parking signs. <laughs> so much for the road to inspectors, Jeff. <clears throat> Jersey, it said, is a parasitic community that cannot support itself except by attracting to its shores those who want to escape from their social duties in Britain. This was before the takeoff, because it was to occur quite soon after, the takeoff of the uh, finance industry. And again, they, were, they, they wanted parish assemblies to elect meeting chairs and that there be parish councils for larger parishes, something that Crowcroft is actually now trying to bring, or was trying to bring into St. Helier. Uh, the large businesses, bar a few UK ones, must be owned by the people of Jersey. This is where their policy had a communist or socialist stamp to it. But the rest of it was fairly uh, standard social reform material. Um, <clears throat> and small business owners should be encouraged to set up cooperatives. Uh, there should be the provision of more general and varied indoor amusement for tourists. Uh, Fort Regent was yet to appear, and of course it became that venue, so to speak. There should be an end to the private development of all coastal areas. <laughs> we've, we've been there before. And a Channel Island Technical College to offer all kinds of vocational training. And lastly, another source of financing social amenities would be the ending of a large slice of state's expenditure at present devoted to highly paid positions at the top of the company machine. So there we have it. So, Norman entered the States in 1966. I'm losing my pictures here. Uh, in, in that kind of environment which I've mentioned. And that's him campaigning. Uh, that photo there is of a, a, another uh, left representative, Jimmy Johns. He's second in from the uh, left on that photo. And here's Norman, we'll come back to it, but that's doing 
what he did throughout most of his life, uh, chairing the Channel Island Cooperative uh, Movement, and that's him opening the St. Peter store. Which, oddly enough, the building of which was approved under his presidency of planning. He approved the design. <laughs> Conflict there, maybe. Okay, I've talked about... Uh, Essentially, when he entered the States, he was in the political wilderness. And uh, <clears throat> he moved various projects of social reforms around divorce laws and so forth. Not, not a lot got through, not as many, not the cascade we've seen in the last 20, 30 years. But he did move very, and he remained very much a uh, social reformer. <clears throat> uh, promoting uh, social agenda. His break came when he was invited onto the Island Development Committee by Pierre Horsfall. He became vice president of the committee, and on the departure of Horsfall, he became the president. And as he said at the time, and it's all very sad, I never thought anyone would invite me to do anything. He'd basically been ostracized uh, within the States to that point. And uh, what happened was a very interesting friendship developed, which I'll come back to, um, <clears throat> between him and his vice president called Sir Martin Lecane. Two more unlikely uh, partners uh, you could not imagine. Yeah. Lecane was straight out of the uh, British diplomatic service with uh, all the attributes you would associate with that. And, uh, but they got on very well. They got on very well. Horsfall uh, said of Norman Lebrock, I haven't had a better vice president. He's practical, he's deep caring for the well-being of people. If he said something, it was worth listening to, and he was a very logical person. And he served to 1987. Uh, there was, I'll go back to it, there was an interesting incident that occurred. But Shenton tried to uh, vote, get him uh, voted off the planning committee, he moved a vote of no confidence in uh, LeBrock. And of course it was the custom, if you won a vote, and he won by one vote, Shenton, if you won a vote, you yourself would take over the committee. And, uh, but he refused to. So a few weeks later, it was put up for a vote again, and Norman got back in. He was basically voted back in. Shenton said, um, I wasn't after the policy of the man, I was after the state of the planning department. That was all chaotic and so forth and so on. But uh, he was to be heavily criticised, Shenton, by the, uh, the left. And there, was, and there was a time when Norman was accused of bringing an island plan by a Mr. Dunn that he, he was told it was a capitalist document. And uh, Mr. Dunn said, he's with us, it would be naive and silly not to recognise Deputy LeBrock's predicament as a lone voice in a hostile state's assembly. And this is one of the few occasions we get to hear what Norman's thinking is actually, because he very rarely discussed the issue of communism, although you go to all these classes about it if you were so minded. The party did run all these uh, classes. But he very rarely discussed that. It's only in that book, um, which I'll send around, maybe. sorry I'm jumping from the camera. It's only in this book called Jersey Looks Forward uh, where he writes the history of the labour movement in Jersey. Yes. He writes the history of the labour movement in Jersey. Uh, but it's not that theoretical, the book. He, um, he talks at class and all the working class all the time, obviously. But it's not that theoretical. <clears throat> and anyway, he said in... Uh, replied to this criticism that he was bringing a capitalist plan. It would be amazing if it were anything else than a capitalist document. The older I get, the deeper is my conviction that Karl Marx's analysis of man's history and society is the only one that stands up to scrutiny. Once elected, and I could participate, I could participate or I could remain on the sidelines and refusing responsibility but keeping my socialist principles pure. This is always the issue when a radical or an opposition, a, a strict opposition person comes into government. What do they do? I mean, you had that in a sense with Tony Benn. I mean, Tony Benn became a pure socialist once he'd left government. 
But when he was in government, he was a politician. For example, he pushed Concord um, when he, he was technology minister, although it made no economic sense. But he was a Bristol MP, he was a Bristol aircraft factory. Uh, and he did the same with uh, the Triumph Mozart company, um, as, as you may recall, when he said of a work is uh, cooperative. But anyway, this is uh, Norman saying, look, I've got a compromise within the system. I'm in it. They've given me a position of power and influence. I've got a compromise. <clears throat> um, there's one incident, I'll just revert. <clears throat> That's Norman at work. When he was in the States, he didn't get paid, obviously. He was the man who pioneered it. And there was this thing called the bucket. His, uh, his uh, supporters used to go around uh, with a bucket on Saturday mornings, it appeared. But he, by then, having started, as you heard, in the gas company, he moved to be a stonemason and trained himself. And that's him building, I don't know if you recognize the spot. Yeah, uh, Charing Cross. Yeah, Charing Cross. Yeah. That's him building it. So um, that's what he did in between states meetings, basically, because he obviously had to um, earn money. <clears throat> but there was an incident which it's worth recalling. In 1966, he went to Moscow on a one-month visit. And uh, <clears throat> as the JP delighted in saying, paid for by the Soviet states, <laughs> They made sure they, uh, they got that in. And he went there, and I'm trying uh, to find out, uh, there was a famous quote that emanated uh, from there, which again he got into trouble. He called Jersey in an interview just before he left, semi-feudal, the island had low taxation, low wages, nepotism, graft and corruption. Now, we all know that to be untrue. But <laughs> anyway, he got into deep trouble with, as I said, his nemesis, the JP, so it all started off. But a very interesting thing happened. He was in Moscow, and it's Bob Aswir who tells the story. And um, <clears throat> far away in Siberia, there was a chap in one of the gulags who was called to the commandant's uh, office and told you're getting on a plane. So he got on a plane this chap, but he didn't have any choice, obviously. <laughs> and he ended up in this very big building in Moscow, which he thought was the Ljubljana, you know, the headquarters of the KGB. And he ended up in this very big building. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, the door opened, and who was on the other side but Norman Lebrock? And Les Hewlin, I think Les Hewlin was with him. And it transpired. This was Bill, a chap who knew he's a Gould had uh, looked after. And uh, Norman had made representations that uh, he be allowed to meet him. And at that point, Bill was actually released because Norman confirmed who he was and so forth. So it's a very interesting uh, human story. As another aside, um, unlike a lot of communists, Norman never wavered. Like when Hungary occurred, when the revelations about Stalin occurred, when Czechoslovakia occurred, Norman never wavered. His adherence to communism remained strong. He maintains, he told uh, the Soviets his views on Hungary when he was there. But again, this was uh, raised as an issue. But he never certainly wavered, whereas a lot of people deserted. A lot of the Europeans and the Brits, they deserted their communist parties uh, at that time, as you uh, probably know. So... That's just, uh, sorry, just going back to a very interesting little story. Back to the Island Development Committee, it was a reforming committee under Norman. He brought in zoning, which not everybody likes. <laughs> he brought in an island plan, and, I, and he was, although a lot of people seem to be uh, claiming uh, credit, he was responsible for, for Le Miel, you know, redeveloping St. Twans, getting rid of those many dumps that were along St. Juan's Bay. But it said a lot of people have been photographed with Mick Romrell against uh, <laughs> Miel saying, I did it. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> he, uh, <clears throat> he eventually left the planning committee and he became chairman of the Hedges Council. And his very last position with the states, which might be construed as the uh, running the Siberian power station posting, which he used to get in the Soviet Union, uh, his very last position 
was head of the uh, Jersey Walls Council. And this was a little group in the States who gave grants to people whose granite walls were falling down. And the States gave grants. To, and of course, Norman, having been a stonemason, he did actually have the technical ability, obviously, uh, in that area. So uh, that, that's uh, quite interesting. He, um, <clears throat> as I said, he left the States in 87. Uh, he still remained the only working uh, person in the States, as I remember. There was no one else at that point uh, succeeding him. All this time he was chair of the Channel Island Co-op, but then he threw his lot in with that most middle class of organisations, the National Trust, <laughs> and became president of the National Trust. And there's no doubt at that point the environmental side of his thinking had, you know, had taken over. He'd become a, a committed environmentalist, um, although, as I said, he never, ever gave up his, um, his beliefs. So he did remain, in that sense, uh, faithful. He withstood the isolation. He became what we might label these days a social democrat rather than a communist. So to that extent, he maybe was a disappointment. There, there remained all the time a little communist party, but it was never, obviously, a mass movement in Jersey. But there was a little communist party. But they had merged their interests with the JDM, the Jersey Democratic Movement. The only group who didn't, there was a group called the Jersey Labour Party, founded in 1921. Very active, like the English Labour Party, with trade unions. But they gradually collapsed. They, didn't, they never became a big force in Jersey, although I think there were attempts and there was some uh, uh, religious gentleman involved, a rector, I can't remember which parish or I don't know which parish. There was an attempt to revive it, but it never really uh, got off the ground. So, <clears throat> so he made a, a major contribution to the states. And uh, while the JP never warmed to him uh, at that time, uh, the world was to change uh, later. And the JP editorial, <coughs> following his uh, death, said, Mr. LeBrock proved that his humanity was matched by practicality, <coughs> sound common sense, and a capacity for hard work. If it is inevitable that he will be remembered for a political stance, let us recall that he was a communist who was also an ardent democrat and a common man who also had uncommon talents. That was the uh, JP's words upon his death. Now there was an official uh, tribute given him at St. Saviour's Parish Hall by what today we call the establishment. And I'll give you a couple of quotes from what people said because I've no doubt he would have been unbelievably embarrassed to have heard all this, to have heard how much he was seen as having gone, so to speak, to the other side. Yes. Sir Martin McCain said he was an intransigent Democrat. He was convinced of the need for change. This man, who I had been informed was devoted to the subversion of the system by guile and revolution, was in fact calm, good-tempered, and cooperative. And just as an aside, that was a time in Jersey, there were two diplomats in the Jersey States at that point, and there was a third distinguished Jersey diplomat who never entered the States called Sir Samuel Ford. But Sir Robin Marritt was in the States, and he apparently sent, uh, had sent uh, Norman uh, a message saying, look Norman, I know when the re revolution comes, I'm going to be executed. Could you put a word in for me? <laughs> so uh, things were getting along fairly well with uh, these strange bedfellows, uh, so to speak. And uh, we had the then current bailiff, um, our uh, highly esteemed candidate at the moment in St. Clements, uh, Sir Ooh. Philip Ballash. He said, for years a voice in the wilderness, he found in late life many of his ideals becoming accepted government policy. So uh, that's an interesting uh, insight from somebody who uh, you wouldn't have seen on the same side. So that basically is the story of Norman LeBrock. 
Uh, I didn't mention his wife. His wife was very loyal to him. She fought all that. She never became a communist. Uh, she was a midwife, I understand, at the Le Bar Centre. He had two children. And uh, he lived in a house in Grand Vaux called Ros Nor. Rose, his wife, Norman, him. Still there with the same name. Uh, on the first big corner um, next to Morrison's. Ooh. Just up diagonally opposite Morrison's. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, the Jersey system found them very difficult to deal with. Uh, they, uh, <clears throat> they never engaged with him politically, obviously. It was always, uh, he would always remain quite isolated. But as I said, there wasn't a great written output from him. <clears throat> and uh, certainly the public never heard of many discussions about Jersey as a communist. This is the little... Um, All right, thanks. Uh, Jersey's Way to Socialism, that was published as a result of those wartime meetings. And a lot of those policy points you will find remain. The one that doesn't, and even that, is the nationalisation of all utilities. Well, all of them are nationalised in Jersey by the gas company, uh, interestingly. So, um, <clears throat> but he never said a lot about the finance industry. I mean, he did call Jersey parasitic, as you obviously... Uh, heard, uh, but he never said an awful lot about the finance industry. So uh, <clears throat> again, we, we weren't to get his views there. And by that time, I got the impression he'd swung over to environmentalism as his um, sort of raison d'etre, his political raison d'etre. So that's the story of Norman LeBrock. Any questions?